break the desks. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good start, breaking our furniture. Uh, and you use the microphone provided. Michael. Do you need a coffee? How are you feeling? Yeah, no, I'm on, I'm on, my, uh, on my third, so uh, yeah, going all right, going all right. Um, I know it's a quick turnaround. Mm. How's the squad from last night? And then maybe I suppose the next one to ask is, is Romero. Yeah, um, look, last night, uh, yeah, just sort of, the brief I got after the game was that uh, everyone came through unscathed, so there's no issues from uh, from last night. Um, yeah, Christian, uh, we'll see how he goes next couple of days. The idea is to try and get him out there and train. He's pretty keen to, so um, he's a chance for the weekend. Uh, Mikey probably still uh, not right for the weekend, and uh, probably Timo as well. So um, really, out of the ones out, it's only really Christian that potentially will be back. Richarlison. It's feels so unlucky. Um, is it becoming a, a bit of a concern for him now? And how is he mentally? Because he looked so distraught last week. Yeah, no, he was, he was very disappointed because I think I said in the lead up, you know, we try to take a little bit of a different approach and he worked awfully hard on, on his rehab, but not just his rehab, his general fitness. Um, you know, he it really trimmed down in terms of his, you know, conditioning and um, he was doing everything right. We kind of eased him back into playing, you know, we didn't try, try didn't, not to overload him and you know unfortunately you know he, he broke down again and uh look he's disappointed but ultimately um you know we just got to keep getting back getting him back in there and, and working with him to, to get him back up because he's an important player i mean you even saw last week the impact he had coming off the bench and setting up the goal for us so disappointing for him disappointing for us um because we haven't really had him at our disposal this year but we'll just keep working with richie and trying to get him back Perhaps the Liverpool side, there's been ups and downs from nearly every club in the Premier League this season. Um, when do you, as a manager, take real careful look at, at the league table? Is it still a bit too early to look at it in great depth? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, we're still a hell of a long way to go. And I think for us, what's important is we, uh, as I said, just keep um, progressing in the way we have been. Our football, for the large part, has been you know, pretty consistent, pretty good. Um, we've obviously had a you know, a couple of um, stumbles along the way. But I think um, within that context, I still think, um, you know, we're making progress and that's what we'll keep doing. I mean, it's, uh, it's no point looking at the table now um, because ultimately it's where you are at the end of the season It's going to count. I appreciate this is before your time. Uh, Hugo Lloris is, is bringing out a book. Um, I'm one of the bits that's been put out in the paper. Um, Talking about maybe the club's mentality in the past, maybe in the past fourth is considered an achievement. Do you ever get that feeling when you're in discussions about ambitions in the future here about, yeah, top four, that, that's great for this football club. Have you ever had that in meetings? No, look, I, you know, I think, I mean, I sort of obviously, I haven't read um, what Hugo said. I mean, it's been sort of mentioned to me, but I think with all these things, you just got to put context around them and, and understand you know, the broader view of, you know, that was a, could have been a very, very successful period for the club, you know, they were very, very close. So you're talking about, you know, finishing runners up in the Premier League and runners up in the Champions League, uh, could have been a very different era and maybe, you know, in retrospect, you'd be looking at those things. So, you know, it's easy to focus on the negatives when the outcome's not what you want, but there's obviously a lot right at the time, which got them very close to the ultimate. So. Yeah, from my perspective, I've look. I've never allowed anyone else to dictate kind of my ambitions um, or sort of my aims, and and you know what I try and do with everyone around me is to make sure that you don't, you know, put a limit on what you can achieve. Because obviously, if you do, then potentially you might miss something um, that comes along your way. So, um, you know, for me, from the moment I started, this has been a pretty clear brief about what we want to try and achieve, and yeah, you know, that's what we'll work towards. Thanks, mate. Hi, Andrew. And just an update on Mickey van der Ven. Can we still expect him back after the international break? Yeah, it will be after the international break. When after, we'll, we'll just dictate um, sort of his progress during that time. Um, so, you know, I think come on, it's probably the end of the international break is about four weeks. So it'll be some time after that, which, when exactly, we'll just have to wait and see. <coughs> in terms of, of the fitness of your captain, Hugh Min Son, obviously we saw him come off um, in the second half against Villa half-time yesterday. Do you feel that he is now 100% back to his best, fully fit and can play the full 90? Yeah, look, uh, it's, I mean, I, I, like I said, for Sonny, you know, 
we obviously he had the injury, we brought him back, and you know in the first game back he kind of had a relapse. And what we don't want to do is put put him into that cycle. It's very easy to fall into that cycle by pushing players, um, particularly when they're coming back from injury. So you know we're just managing his minutes and building him up. And uh, you know he got a good 55 on the weekend. He got 45 last night. Uh, <clears throat> you know hopefully we can continue to build that up. But ultimately for us it's about making sure that we get him back and keep him back because we can't afford any more injuries uh, in that position. We've already got, you know, Wilson with a long-term injury. We've got Sonny, obviously, with a... uh, Sorry, Richie with a long-term injury. We've got Mikey out now. So, you know, we can't afford to to sort of lose another player in that area of the park. So, you know, I'll always make decisions that I think are best for the club um, and for us and what we're trying to achieve. And in terms of your opponent's dip switch this weekend, um, I covered the game last week. It did look like until the 94th minute they were going to secure their first Premier League win of the season. Um, how much more dangerous does it make them as opponents knowing that they will be desperate for that first Premier League win of the season? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think I've said before, I think every every weekend, or every league game has its potential, um, you know, to, to hurt you if you're not at your best and... Um, yeah, Ipswich is going to be no different. As you said, that they got close last week. I think they've been close in, the, in a number of games this year. Um, I think Kieran McKenna's done an unbelievable job since he's been there, and I think they continue to grow. It's always harder for for clubs who get promoted who haven't sort of gone down and got the benefit of parachutes and payments and, and you know experience. So the fact that he's got them competitive, and I think they have been competitive in, in just about every game this year, is a credit to him and, and his players. So we're expecting a tough one on the weekend, like we do every week, but. You know, our form, particularly at home, has been uh, you know, pretty strong this year and we want to continue that. Yeah. Hi, and Charlie. I'm good, mate. Um, it feels like a very open Premier League this season. I mean, teams that you would normally expect to be in the top three, like Arsenal, are not there right now. You could go third. Forest are doing really well. Did it feel like that to you? Um, yeah, fair to say there's no kind of anyone, who's, apart from Liverpool, I guess, who have hit sort of real consistency. Um and I guess, you know, some of it's on the back of, you know, some of the clubs you mentioned having significant injuries, which, you know, will affect every team. Obviously, you know, they've, they've got stronger squads, but, you know, we saw it with us last year. You know, you get hit by injuries in certain areas, it will affect. So that's part of it. Um, yeah, other teams are, are showing some real consistency earlier this year. And as you said, Forrest have been really, really good. You know, Brighton have been good. So, yeah, it feels more open, um, for sure. Um, but again, I think you've just got to... With these kind of things, you know, wait till you get a little bit more into the season to see how it all sort of pans out. Because, um, you know, any club that gets hit with significant injuries in one particular area could have, you know, have the same sort of challenges that some of the top clubs are. It seemed in recent years that the number nine was sort of going out of fashion and playing false nines was, was the way that a lot of managers wanted to do it. Yet this week we've seen Victor Ocker is a sport in Lisbon. Obviously, you saw Osman last night. Last week we saw Dominic Solanke for you. Is he in, in that bracket? And do you think that seeing these players scoring the number of goals they're now scoring will encourage more kids to want to be a number nine? Yeah, look, I, 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 you know, I, I get that we love, we love a trend, uh, uh, particularly one that lasts, you know, as long as three weeks in, in the game. But we've got Lewandowski, we've got Harry Kane. There's some pretty good strikers around the place. Um, and... You know, it's a it's a challenging position for sure. It always has been in our game uh, because scoring goals is still the most difficult thing to do uh, in football. And and to play in that position, you have to have a certain personality. I've always believed a really strong mindset because ultimately, what you do know is that you know you you never get multitudes of chances and the ability to to forget what's happened before and focus on next chance. Um, when you get players like that. Um, yeah, that's why they're they're worth their weight in gold, and I've left out a certain Harland in that as well. So, um, and look, we're we're really happy with Dom. Um, like I said, not just his goals, his general play, and the way he's kind of coming to the club. He's become a bit of a leader on the field, and great for us. And I certainly believe there's there's more in him. And and you know, I've always liked to play with uh, you know, strikers. You know, I, I dabbled with false nines as well, only because I was bored for a season. And uh, you know, but if you've got a good striker, you you put him in your team. And when you mentioned Hugo Lloris, or you were asked about Hugo's yeah. book, um, you said you never put a ceiling on your ambitions yeah. or on, on your aims. What about players? How do, you, how do you convince a player who 
because it's easy to have been sort of ground into you that Champions League playing in that is everything. Mm. So how do you get over to a player not to put a limit on their ambitions or their, their ceiling? I mean, the top four isn't the trophy that they should be after. It's just, I guess that's just a, a kind of a daily process of, you know, how you work on a daily basis. If, if, if your mindset every day is to come in and improve, well, you know, how do you know where that's going to take you, you know? And if, if you're already putting a, a ceiling on that or a target on that, then that, you know, that ambition to improve every day kind of diminishes because you've got a set target and I just, I've never believed in set targets. Like I said, if, if, if I had ambitions, clear ambitions when I was coaching in Australia, I, I probably would have surpassed them in my first two years of coaching. So I see that in, in kind of my own journey and I've seen it and the players have been no different. I mean, there's, there's you know, you, you look at their own stories, where they started to where they are. I'm sure there was plenty of people along the way who told them that they weren't going to make it for one reason or another, but they're here. So you should never limit what you're doing. Like I said, that's a daily process for me. It's not. That's why I don't talk about you know, where we're going to end up. What I talk about is, you know what, well, let's, let's be better today than we were yesterday and keep doing that. And if, if that is a continual process, in time you'll see where your limits are and, uh, you know, rather than predetermine them, let them sort of come to fruition after, you know, having the right mindset. Jack. And we've talked a lot about the success of your decision to move Kulisewski into midfield this season. Can you talk a bit about your thought process for doing that? And was there a specific moment that led you to that conclusion? Um, not, not a specific moment. Like, like I think I've said before, I think, you know, with, with Decky, I think the way we get our wingers to play probably doesn't suit him more, not his skill set. More, I think his personality. He just he's just a player who's much more engaged in the game when he's constantly involved. And, and bringing him into the central area means he's constantly doing that. I think at times with us last year, he, when, when he was on the wing, he kind of, you know, with the way our wingers play, you're not involved all the time. There's a discipline in keeping your position, and and sometimes not receiving the ball is part of that process. Of, you know, we we put our wingers where we do to sort of pin back oppositions and I could see you know he was not frustrated but you know he just wanted to give more so you know we obviously towards the back end of last year we played him kind of inside a couple of times and you could see him sort of growing into that and uh, you know certainly from the beginning of pre-season today this year <clears throat> it was always the intention to bring him back bring him inside and, and let him develop and he has and he's improving that's the key thing it's not like it's just gone inside but he's actually working on his game areas where he can hurt the opposition working on the defensive side of his game because it's a little bit different to playing out in the wing and um, and I think he's enjoying it which obviously you know helps in terms of his own development did you did you say that you'd seen him you'd seen that he had played there for Atlanta yeah yeah no look I'd, I'd looked at his background obviously and um, you know when he was growing up and, and sort of when he first uh, broken the first team that was kind of his position and then sort of and uh, look it's not that he can't play out wide I think he got sort of put in that position because he was effective out there you know when he played and particularly in teams that kind of played counter-attacking football which allowed him then the space to run at people I think um, you could see why he'd go out there but but some of it's just you know natural development of players there's plenty of wide players who end up playing inside because their game develops and they understand more about it and I think he's one of those what does he need to add to his game next what's the next challenge like I said before, just, you know, that's exactly my point is just constant improvement in everything, you know. There's nothing that he doesn't, he can't improve in. And, and you know, Decky's, you know, we talk about ambition. If you speak to him, he's got pretty lofty ambitions for himself as a player um, and what he can do. And, you know, with that kind of mindset, he can improve in all facets of his game. Um, he's already very, very effective for us um, with and without the ball. Um, but, you know, the exciting bit is I think there's a lot more to come.